You're listening to E-Commerce Fastlane, the podcast show to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Listen to real conversations with partners and subject matter experts as they share proven practical strategies, platforms, and the best Shopify apps to help you accelerate your business. The time is now for you to improve efficiencies, grow revenue, profit, and lifetime customer loyalty. Please welcome your host, startup founder and strategic advisor, Steve Hutt. Welcome to another episode of E-Commerce Lane. I'm your host, Steve Hutt. And today I'm thrilled to have Georgie Slobodanyak, who's the Director of Technology at Absolute Web. Now, Georgie brings over a decade of experience in e-commerce on the both development and the design side of the business, but he specializes in Shopify customization and platform migrations. Now, Absolute Web really is a leading e-commerce agency. I know they're a plus technology partner. They've been in the ecosystem for over 20 years, and he now leads a team that provides like comprehensive services, both to the mid-market and to enterprise level brands. Now, on today's episode, what we're gonna explore a bit is about the customizations that are possible with Shopify. There's a lot of things going on, both the strategy of optimizing these storefronts, and I think Georgie, he really brings a lot of insight on how to stay competitive in today's digital landscape, and then how to simplify a lot of these complex technical processes. And that's one of the, uh, I guess, superpowers that Absolute Web kind of brings to the market. Today, you can also expect some actionable tips, really how can you leverage technology so you can boost conversions, how you can streamline your operations and how you can create unique kind of one-on-one shopping experiences. I really wanna talk more about the whole journey from Magento to Shopify and just how they really have their flag in the sand. They really are a great partner of Shopify and I'm excited to kind of unpack a lot of Georgie's kind of technical expertise but also his strategic thinking. And I believe this is gonna be a very, very uh, valuable and actionable recording. So hi, Jordan, Uh, welcome to e-commerce Fastlane. Hey, Steve, thanks for having me. Now to kick this episode off, could you kind of share with our audience what initially drew you to the e-commerce industry? And then how do you believe that experience has shaped your approach to your current role at Absolute Web? Well, to start off, I think I could answer this question from the perspective of Absolute Web. I've been here since 2012, and originally we had a variety of customers that came from different industries, some of which uh, were in real estate, and we kind of got the sense that it's very difficult to work with and suggest solutions for clients that don't directly make money from their web presence. And so we were always constrained on what we could recommend or what we could do because the website wasn't really the driving factor in business decisions. And the pivot was made kind of out of necessity because it's just so much easier to make money for a business that actually sells things online. And it's very difficult to track the impact and the revenue of a business that primarily deals with off-site business. My experience at Absolute Web is kind of incredible in the sense that I've been given a lot of opportunity to fail and to try different things and to experiment. And I feel like while we may not have always had success in our projects, we've always grown from them and we never settled for a particular approach or strategy because, well, frankly, I get bored of doing the same thing over and over. And I think this position was almost like a perfect fit for me to get to experiment and explore and learn and grow and do it continuously. And this has reinforced some of the principles with which I arrive at specific solutions for our merchants. Now, with your merchant role and and significant experience in e-commerce, what have you seen about how are brands creating different experiences that are unique in e-commerce today? So I've seen so many things that I probably wouldn't be able to enumerate all of them, but I'll say that in general, the customers 
that we see succeeding the most have a broad strategy and let's call them tendrils in different aspects of the customer journey. There are those that worry about their brand presence and try to tell a story, uh, an interesting story about their brand. There are those that try to tackle the problem of sustainability, uh, the problem of inequality, the problem uh, associated with the environment uh, in their storytelling of their brand. And we see a decent amount of success in, in those merchants. Then we have those that are trying to really reduce friction to kind of minimize the friction that a customer has uh, to purchase. And so we'll see a lot of uh, unique innovations around how they approach categorization, how do they approach um, how they reach out to their customers uh, over email or SMS, and how do they remove steps from the process to make it just as easy as possible to purchase and to come back and uh, to derive value from the website. Another thing that we tend to see that works well is the idea of personalization, not just from uh, really good product recommendations uh, on site and in engagement over email and you know the broader uh, social channels, but the idea of having products that are really unique and personalizable and not one size fits all, uh, providing customers with a way to really gift things that are interesting and not, uh, let's call them cookie cutter, and derive from those customizations uh, like a really, really cool experience. So we have a merchant that we've worked with for a long time that does pet pop art when they originally came to us, they were kind of dealing with the process of a customer pays for a garment, sends over email a picture of their pet, and goes over you know 20 to 50 <laughs> email conversations back and forth with the designers to align on what looks good and what's printable. And... Uh, taking that process, which is extremely inefficient and uh, frankly not profitable, uh, not scalable, to a centralized order management system that was custom built to support the flow and also to support their business when they weren't really in peak season. So how do you get people to come and buy your product when your product very much is a gift product? Um, their idea was to incentivize um, their customers to come in and get free products um, that are designed based on prior art, right? So, hey, we've uh, we've taken your pet and we've provided the pop art before. Now you can go in and just get a significantly reduced rate on a garment with this design already prepared. Um, and then since they had design staff on payroll, it's better to put them to work uh, than to just keep them idle. And so there were periods of time where free art was allocated uh, to customers that were interested in, in it and to kind of make people happy by giving them things for free. Um, and you know, you just pay for the garment uh, or the shipping as opposed to, you know, having the, you know, the desire to pay 40 or $60 for, for the garment with the design work. Think about Shopify. And as you know, I was a former Shopify employee, merchant success manager for so for six years. And there always were these people that said, well, I don't believe that can be done on Shopify or it shouldn't be done on Shopify. And I think there's a lot of things that really are possible on Shopify. And I think that's a big misconception. And so can you talk a little bit about some of these ideas, why people think that certain things can't be done on Shopify? And can you talk a little bit about Absolute Web and um, how you're able to challenge a lot of these assumptions? Uh, this is kind of my favorite kind of question because it uh, has so many different ways to, to answer. But I'll start with historically. Um, Shopify has been more difficult to provide with um, 
a kind of baseline level of e-commerce functionality that was expected of a lot of mid-market uh, and enterprise brands. And so for, for these merchants, they'd come to Shopify, they would potentially create a matrix decision diagram and identify what features are and aren't available in Shopify. And they would strictly rely on the out-of-the-box feature set to determine whether or not it was a viable platform for them to choose. And over time, this has uh, changed as Shopify has decided to remove more and more of their weaknesses by introducing things that have simplified uh, a lot of the things that were previously you know, very custom and difficult to do. One example of this is around promotions. Historically with Shopify, if you wanted to create really unique promotions, you had to implement something called the draft orders API. And so essentially what that meant was whenever there was a product that you had where some specific, very unique discount rule had to be applied, instead of going to Shopify's own systems to create this behavior, this price reduction, this customization that you were looking for, it had to go to your own server, right? So you'd have to build this whole thing that had to be reliable, right? So reliability for Shopify kind of goes out the window where now you introduce your own system that has to be battle tested, has to be 100% up all the time if it's always in the way of someone being able to purchase. And then in your own uh, back end, you, po- you code it in any language you want, you get to determine how the promotion is applied, whether the current card is eligible, and all of these things. And you would generate a draft order in Shopify using their API, and then redirect a customer to this uh, cart. And that was something that a lot of companies were not willing to do, uh, though those that were on Shopify kind of were forced to. A lot of uh, merchants were just not willing to go through that level of customization just to get some custom pricing and promotional uh, logic implemented on their store. And to change that dynamic, Shopify introduced uh, many different features. They introduced cart transformers, they introduced price functions, and almost no one should be using draft orders unless there's something really, really unique that they have to build for customer service um, or custom products. But even then, I would probably stay away from that API because there are just so many better options that rely on native functionality in Shopify that doesn't require you to completely override and intercept that cart behavior. It's a lot safer to do. And it's not just that. Um, a lot of merchants had problems when it came to B2B. And B2B is another weakness that Shopify has been patching up over the years. And now almost all of the merchants where three years ago we would have said Shopify is just not the right fit because there's going to be too much work to just get to a baseline level of functionality for B2B. We now have a really good baseline and we can extend from that baseline uh, kind of as much as we want. But as long as we have that rock solid baseline, so many things are possible in a cheaper way. And when I say cheaper, I don't just mean cost. I mean calendar time. I mean the complexity of the solution. I mean uh, how easy it is to maintain over time. These are really, really important points that I think a lot of people uh, used to assume would have been too much effort to expend on Shopify. And now it's just going in the opposite direction. It's just, it's almost like, I'll give you uh, an example here. If you try to implement a feature in Magento, Adobe Commerce, and that feature is, say, 80 hours of work, um, the equivalent feature on Shopify, if it's not available, could take like 20 with a custom bespoke backend that's just doing that one thing really well. That's the critical area that I see a lot of people uh, assume about Shopify, yes, if you're just looking at Shopify's core feature set and you assume that none of it can be extended beyond the native uh, extensions, then sure, people people will say Shopify can't do X, Y, and Z. But when you tie it to a backend, any backend, could be Ruby, could be PHP, could be Elixir, could be Python, Cloudflare Workers, no, JavaScript, right? Any of these things uh, can be hooked to Shopify in many, many different ways. 
And it's way easier to maintain an application like a customization that does something really well and only that one thing. When you have to diagnose a problem in Magento or Adobe Commerce or like a full, uh, full-fledged e-commerce system, one mistake can kind of wreck the entire system. There's like a big surface area for introducing a problem if you make a mistake somewhere in the extension code. But with Shopify, if you do it right, if you architect it right, it'll just be that feature that fails and almost nothing else will. And so it creates just a happier place uh, that's far uh, less noisy when it comes to issues. And it allows for uh, testing much less because there is uh, such a smaller surface area, like a, like a lack of cascading in the issues in Shopify where you kind of work on your own thing, you get it done, and you leave it alone, and you pretty much never have to deal with it. Yeah, over time, Shopify's APIs change, and you know maybe one or two, three years from now, you have to update to a better version of the Shopify API. And that has happened over time, and that's definitely maintenance that you have to spend. Uh, but it's certainly, I think, a lot smaller than a lot of other backend systems. So getting back to your last question, the way that we tend to challenge these assumptions is, quite frankly, just proof of concepts. Uh, when merchants come to us and they say, I honestly don't think that that's on the table, here's why. And we could just come back to them and like, here's a demo of it working. Uh, we've had numerous merchants where if they come to us with an assumption, an incorrect assumption about Shopify, the pre-sales uh, cycle, right? Just the cycle where they're just you're just talking and you haven't even arrived at a solution, you haven't even really started scoping. Shopify is so easy um, to develop on top of. It's so easy to create like really, really basic MVPs that you can prove to someone it's possible in a very short amount of time without expending a lot of resources on it, without even having to do discovery. When it comes to something like uh, Adobe Commerce or uh, even WooCommerce, if you're trying to introduce something, a new feature, uh, and prove that something is possible, you kind of want to avoid just associating a fixed cost with that project because you may not know exactly how to approach it. And so you might have a discovery, and in that discovery, you might have a proof of concept that you build out just to validate that the solution is possible technically, and that it aligns with the requirements. And with Shopify, sometimes it's as easy as spending like 30 minutes or an hour um, writing some code that maybe you borrow from another area that is functionally very similar, and it just works. And you demonstrate it, and the merchant is like, well, that's pretty cool. And I, I love that. I love, I love doing that. And that's kind of one of the ways that we uh, challenge our customers' assumptions. Now, I'd love to go even one further. Are you able to maybe elaborate a little more on some common misconceptions around maybe some of the customizations that are possible on Shopify and then how Absolute Web is able to address them? Yeah, we can go systematically. Um, one area that has been a problem area for Shopify before was in custom data and custom attributes. And Customers would say, well, I need a custom field for an order, and I need to hold this custom field. So that custom field could be a delivery date uh, if you're processing food. And another one could be, we want to provide custom pricing to our customers based on where their delivery address is located. And so the further away they are from our warehouses, the more expensive it is for us to deliver, and therefore we want to upcharge based on how far away they are from our DC, our distribution center. Uh, or we will have merchants that say, hey, uh, we don't want to build a full backend that's going to retain custom information about our customers. We kind of want to retain that information in Shopify. So we have merchants where uh, they might have a list of pets or a list of children associated with their account. And instead of creating a separate backend where we have to store and copy and synchronize to some extent this information, uh, all of these problems 
right, can be solved with meta fields and meta objects. So that's kind of one of the largest areas that Shopify has patched up over the years in terms of flexibility. Meta objects and meta fields allow us to connect to products and variants and orders and locations and customers. Custom fields that can be of a rich set of types that can support a wide variety of functionality, and they can be presented in the admin, they can be presented in the storefront, they can be presented on customer account pages, in extensibility, and checkout. And these pretty much give us superpowers, because in a lot of other systems, when you're building out this kind of an abstraction with custom data, you really do have to code it. You really do have to uh, spend time and energy in trying to figure out what's the correct approach and abstraction uh, that we want to arrive at. And there's a lot of planning, a whole lot of planning that is involved in trying to get it right the first time, because if you get it wrong, it's very expensive to redo in development. Whereas with Shopify, so many of these fields and abstractions can just be proofed and tested just with the UI. You just go into settings, custom data, you click on uh, products, and then you can add a meta field. You define it, you create it, you go to a product, and you test to see if it's doing what you think it does. And if it doesn't, well, you just change the data type by deleting and recreating the meta field. And it's a fantastic way to iterate. And honestly, it's one of the biggest uh, value drivers of Shopify. It's just this really, really rapid iteration cycle that makes it possible to do things and to get it wrong really quickly and to adjust, change, right, and arrive at the right solution or the approximately right solution. And it's also much easier to throw things away if you've only spent one or two hours on them. Much harder to throw away work that maybe you spent weeks on. The next area that I think is really interesting is around theme customization. So a lot of merchants in the past have decided to transition to things like headless because there is a lack of flexibility to the developer to truly make these bespoke experiences that tell a brand story in a powerful way. And Shopify's theme customization game has been on point for the last year. The last thing that I think a lot of people are waiting for is flex blocks. Uh, essentially, they're containers that allow you to set margins and paddings and choose how the flow of the inner elements goes, either column-based or row-based, uh, and nesting of blocks, right? Being able to say that I want a column component. In that column component, I want three tiles. One of the product, uh, sorry, one of the tiles is a slider. Uh, type. Another one could be a gallery. Another one could be something else. And then in them, right, each slide could be a different component. And then you can kind of go on and on, nest up to eight levels. This is a game changer because historically, this nesting capability has only existed in really powerful content management systems that you would have to, you know, use the headless system with. There's always a way for you to use a non headless system. Um, like Shopify themes and connect it to a powerful CMS, but then there's almost always some compromise around how soon that content gets rendered on the page. And essentially, you end up with some impact to performance in SEO because you have to make the call to get the content kind of asynchronously when the page loads. And, um, you know, we know performance is one of those things that. Uh, merchants try to keep up because it has a direct correlation with conversion and kind of a non-starter for a lot of businesses to say, I want to use Shopify themes, but then I will also want to use like a headless content management system. So suffice to say, when it comes to Shopify themes, there is a vast amount of customizations that are possible. And there is a large amount of unification uh, associated with the fact that you have a page and that page uh, is representing a product and the product has meta fields and you can have those meta fields connect to custom components on the page. And this is fantastic because it makes it possible to dynamically create very, very content-rich pages that are dynamically based on the data. 
instead of having to explicitly say, have a content manager go in and create for your 50 different product types, a different kind of landing page, you can truly uh, use Shopify meta object bindings to say, hey, this product should show the section about uh, our transparency and where our ingredients come from. Uh, whereas this product type is a gift bag, and there should be no reason why uh, you show that section at all, because you know it's um, you know this it doesn't even have that property, uh, and so on and so forth. So many customizations can be based on just the data, and. Historically, with other platforms, you can easily do this with just conditionals in the templates, right? So obviously, anyone who's a coder can say, you know what, I can code this template to have a condition that says, if the product is of this type, then I show this section, otherwise I don't. And the thing that I'm trying to convey here is that with Shopify and the theme customizer, you can do that dynamically, and you don't have to be a programmer to do it. So the section can be configured with like a visibility attribute and that visibility attribute can be connected to a property of the product or the collection or the page and it will automatically show or hide and the content manager or the person who's building out the page experience can just reorder reposition and change things without having to ask a developer to do it and that's extremely powerful and this level of customization is really hard to get on a lot of other platforms, you almost always need developers to do these kinds of things on other platforms just because of the, the complexity. I won't get uh, too detailed on this point, but I think oftentimes when we get clients that are on a specific platform with a specific URL structure, they worry about migrating the Shopify and taking that SEO hit that they might inevitably have to face by changing and redirecting the URLs that they have in their current state to the constraints around Shopify URLs. And one of the ways that we solve this problem for our merchants, the ones that can afford it anyway, is through Cloudflare and Cloudflare, specifically Cloudflare Orange to Orange, only available to enterprise. It allows you to have your own Cloudflare entry point for those visitors that are coming to your domain, like your shop domain. And before that request is even sent to the Shopify Cloudflare servers, you get a chance to do something with it. And so for some of our merchants, we've adopted a strategy where we will redirect um, behind the scenes the URL to the kind of Shopify appropriate URL, but keeping the old URL in place. And we can granularly choose to say, okay, you know what, let's take the lowest 5% of pages that have SEO equity and let's set up the canonical to the proper Shopify URL and see what it does uh, to our traffic, see what it does to our rankings over time. And in this way, businesses can kind of creep their migration along without having this full hard cutover and radical um, redirect of their URLs. And we find that this is a misconception that people have, and they just assume that they can't take control of this, but it is, in fact, one area that can be controlled. Another misconception that I often see with engineers specifically is around performance. A lot of engineers seem to think that they can do a better job by having their own, let's call it, headless implementation of a Shopify storefront. And on the surface level, it's absolutely true that you know if you have a statically generated website using something like Gatsby uh, or Astro, something that will statically kind of pre-generate on build the pages of your website, you can have a faster experience than out of the box Shopify. Um, and a lot of engineers are specifically uh, making assumptions around the fact that there are certain things that you can and cannot control within the Shopify theme, and therefore it is a requirement to use something that's a little bit more powerful. And on the surface level, it is true, but there are ways um, that we have taken advantage of out of necessity to actually completely take control over every single script that Shopify kind of injects on the page. There are ways to do it. And um, there are some merchants that we have on 
are kind of, kind of client list that have just such image heavy websites that have so much marketing content that it is almost impossible for us to just leave the Shopify default in place. Because as many of you may know, when you install apps, those apps sometimes tend to have their own injections of scripts. They'll have their own theme blocks that may apply. And there's a lack of granularity in Shopify to say, you know what, Clavio doesn't need a load on my account pages or Clavio doesn't need a load on my FAQ page or something like that. And you kind of, because you don't get that granularity with Shopify, the assumption is that you can't control it. But in fact, you can. It is possible we've done it. Uh, it's probably too gnarly of a solution to talk about on this podcast, but uh, do reach out if you, um, if any of you listening are interested in the, the solution. Now, I mentioned it a bit at the top, but, you know, Absolute Web has shifted focus, thankfully, from Magento to Shopify and more on the Shopify Plus side of the business. Um, and I think it was about maybe seven, eight years ago. So what are some of the projects? I know there's a lot of them. So I went to your website this morning for a recording and you have a lot of case studies. But is there any projects that you're most proud of, like particularly maybe in the areas of theming or maybe even performance marketing or SEO operations, promotion. I mean, anything that kind of uh, catches your fancy, I would love you to share some case studies and some uh, great projects that you're proud of. Questions like this are, of course, difficult to answer. And to be clear, we do work across different platforms. And it's not solely Shopify that we work with, but we choose Shopify 90% of the time for merchants that come to us for platform idea decisions and consulting because it's, to me, just the best platform that gives you the out-of-the-box head start that you need and the customization on top is just so easy and it's uh, just the significantly better value add than any other platform from a cost and timeline perspective for any any really gnarly implementation. But yeah, I'll say that one of the ones that I think I'm most proud of, though I wasn't the one that led the project, though I helped it in many different uh, critical steps, was Open Farm. Uh, so Open Farm came to us from another agency on Gatsby, and there were a lot of problems with the headless implementation. One of them was performance, uh, surprisingly. Headless does not equal performance. Uh, and so even if you choose the right architecture, the right architecture doesn't guarantee what you may sometimes assume to be the case. In this case, performance was really bad. And so we patched a lot of that and we developed a really, really good relationship with the merchant. But over time, uh, as time passed and as leadership changed on their side, they wanted to transition off of headless and we agreed, um, though with caveats around timeline, because for in our mind, we never want to rush to redo something when there's something new that's coming that's going to solve that problem, you know, in the near term. Uh, so for them specifically, they had multiple websites and headless was used as a way to unify and create a single storefront presence even though under the hood they actually had different extension stores for different markets this is back before shopify markets was anywhere near as powerful it was as it was today and so we kind of told them to hold off and almost actually lost the relationship because we were firm in our assumption that Shopify is going to come and release something that's going to help us significantly to make it possible for the website to essentially be brought under a single instance and therefore a simplification of apps and configurations and all this kind of stuff. And ultimately, uh, we did win them back for the bid to migrate them from the headless to native website. And there's so much that's done on the website, not really just from a performance perspective, but from an SEO perspective, uh, from a content perspective, they're a very content-heavy website, and we migrated them off of Contentful as well. Uh, and that significantly simplified their uh, kind of stack because they were relying on Auth0 for authorizing something that Shopify out of the box can do. They were relying on 
uh, contentful for managing all of the custom content on the website, including some content primitives that Shopify supports, like blog articles. And there was so much information that was present in different places and managed in different places that it really made it complicated for them to grow and to really even prioritize things. Like for them, I would I want to say like 20 to 30 percent of their asks felt like, hey, can you rebuild the website? Uh, because with Gatsby, the way that the website was built, it was only possible uh, to get content updated in an SEO friendly manner by cause like actually causing a rebuild. And that was painful uh, for such a long time for them and for us, honestly, because we shouldn't really be <laughs> pushing a button every time that you know someone wants to update content on the website. That's extremely limiting uh, to marketing, content management, etc. Um, but we really did help them uh, simplify the architecture of their website because Shopify got better. It got better in all of the ways that it needed to to make it possible for that migration to happen. And honestly, we're really grateful for that relationship and. Um, we're excited to like now that we've migrated them over to native to really start taking advantage of all of the things that Shopify had on its uh, kind of native implementation uh, that they couldn't take advantage of because they were on headless before. Now I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but the next website that I think uh, me and my team are really proud of is Lashify. Uh, same story. I wasn't the one that was like the core tech lead or architect for the website. Uh, it was a different team, but I, of course, you know, had my hand in different cookie jars and I helped out where I could. And Lashify is truly an incredible, incredible story in the sense that they came to us, same story from another agency. There was a lot to clean up in the code base. And I remember being told by their team that essentially websites are rebuilt every three years. And that's just that's just the norm. It's the status quo. And there's no use in trying to fix or kind of like slowly iterate and improve on the website. Uh, because essentially, the website is not the same as it was, you know, years back. And so it's better to just kind of like start from scratch. And I disagreed with this approach because starting from scratch and kind of redoing everything that was done a different way is really, really time consuming and really expensive. And it creates so many potential problems uh, that, um, you know, I just, <laughs> I just had a difference of opinion. And honestly, over time, we did it. We, we took every page systematically, homepage, product detail page, collection pages, and just rebuilt them from the ground up. And the website is great. Uh, it's fantastic. And when it comes to subscription management and member management, it is probably the gnarliest, most complicated thing that we've ever developed uh, with Recharge. And um, yeah, check it out. You can probably take a look and see uh, just how just how complicated it is. I get the feeling that I'm doing a little bit too much talking. So this will probably be my last story, though. I have many more to share. Uh, and it's uh, on Nation LTD. Uh, one of our other brands. Similar story, inherited from another agency. Uh, this, this other agency essentially did something really, really weird, something that we've never seen before, but they built the entire website with Vue, uh, which is one of these uh, functional uh, kind of uh, new front-end meta frameworks that allows... Uh, like really, really good and convenient developer flexibility uh, at the expense uh, of, uh, let's call it SEO, because of the way that they chose to build the website. So they decided we're going to use Shopify themes, but everything was done in Vue. And so that basically meant that if you didn't have JavaScript or if you were like a search engine, this is of course in the past, but you land on the website, it's a blank page. You don't see anything until you've downloaded all the JavaScript in order to actually populate every single section. Uh, so truly, from a performance perspective, it was extremely, extremely uh, brutal. And you know, this merchant spent so much money in building out this website, and it wasn't releasable. It wasn't ready. It wasn't better than um, their original website from a functional perspective. It was certainly nicer from a visual perspective. And essentially, we uh, engage them with a small retainer 
to slowly kind of patch it up, like just get the critical elements of the website fixed. And uh, over time, as the budget would allow, refactor a lot of the sections from being view native to just server side rendered normal uh, and interactive uh, where necessary. Um, and basically just offload the complexity of having a meta framework like view. And we did it over a year and, you know, the website performance and speed improved and we have been able to integrate with so many more services and integrations, which kind of pull back performance a little bit. Anytime you kind of deal with another integration, especially one that, you know, you didn't implement, uh, there are always things that uh, come up in terms of performance and additional scripts that will set you back. But I think I'm just really happy that we were able to do that for them and, you know, take a success story uh, instead of telling them like, hey, sorry, I think that we just have to redo everything from from scratch. And uh, that's definitely not our approach when we uh, take uh, ownership of migrations. We're always trying to see how do we maximize what has already been built um, and then migrate it in a way that isn't as expensive and do it in an iterative way that's kind of more safe and friendly from a calendar time perspective. Now, every six months, Shopify releases what they call editions, and their latest one was the summer editions. And basically inside there is usually a web portal, or there's a PDF, um, there's usually some webinars and things, but it talks about the products and services and kind of what's been built uh, during that time frame, and it kind of shares them all together. And it gives merchants and marketers kind of the opportunity to pause for a moment and going, hey, I didn't know this was available. Is this applicable to me or how can I implement that? And so it's quite interesting. And so knowing that the summer editions came out and there was a lot of updates on there, um, are there any particular features or releases that you find really exciting? And then how do you see them impacting e-commerce kind of moving forward? One thing that I think I'm really excited for is split shipment. This is one of the last features that are much more challenging to um, help merchants migrate from other platforms to Shopify. It's uh, just possible in other platforms, but has been historically pretty difficult to implement with Shopify without kind of rebuilding the entire checkout experience. And when it, like if, if some agency tells you in order to implement this, we have to rebuild checkout um, from Shopify, like I would say run, uh, it's really, really dangerous to to do that unless you have an extremely simple uh, checkout, which doesn't really have much in the in the line of shipping rules and tax rules and product promotional rules and stuff like that. But I think split shipping is a game changer. It's going to make it much more possible to um, really let the customers optimize how they get their packages and how they spend money on shipping. Right, the idea that you can say, "I want this now," but I want this other stuff later, like that's okay. And then not have to pay express shipping for the entire order, or of course not have to place two orders, right? It's fantastic. Uh, I think that's one of the, one is it one of the, one of the big ticket additions items that I'm really excited for. The next thing that I think is uh, truly interesting is Utopia, the visually, um, the visual hydrogen editor. Historically, hydrogen has, uh, has had the prerequisite of integrating with some content management system. And so you would use Sanity or Contentful or Storyblock or any number of other um, content management like headless systems, including open source ones like Strapi, Payload CMS, and uh, ingesting the response from their API and essentially building out the page. And while this is a fine approach and you know it's worked for years now for for many merchants that we've worked with it's so nice um, to deal with the way that shopify has approached content management uh, when it comes to connecting content management with code releases and so with uh, utopia utopia almost takes the way that you build themes on shopify with uh, github and connecting it to revision control and it brings that to headless where utopia will actually edit the code and it will produce a commit and 
this commit can be checked and validated by developers, just like everything else. And it can be merged into the main line, the trunk of the project and trigger continuous integration, continuous deployment related automations to actually publish that uh, to the website. Now, that's definitely a lot of verbiage. Uh, that's kind of not necessary, but most of the time when you have a headless site, um, you'll have some kind of continuous automation where a uh, developer will push something to a specific branch, and then some system will take that code, build it, maybe run some tests on that, and then publish it to Shopify. And historically, that's just been uh, the way it's uh, been done, but now you can connect content in this kind of incremental way uh, where it can be reviewed. Uh, and it can be connected to code updates, right? So you can say a developer implements a new page type, um, but it's still in testing, right? You don't want to release it to your customers. And then someone from content management can take that branch and then can visually customize how that page looks, which sections are on that page, the content in those sections. And the developer gets to put constraints on what can be done and can't be done by the content editor to avoid a situation where someone pushes some content that is illegal uh, from the perspective of the code, right? So it unifies um, and gives the developer the control that they want around building out those kind of bespoke components and building them reliably. And it allows the developer to say, here, content editor, these are the things that you can legitimately change without truly breaking anything. And the Utopia editor is a way to see all of those changes visually and then publish them so that it can be merged in and released just like code. And that's definitely more of an engineering thing that I find exciting, but there are still use cases around needing um, hydrogen for like truly bespoke, really, really custom websites with um, you know really, really unique URL structures, um, really, really unique content flows. And um, for those that still need it, this is a great option. And yet again, it introduces a way to really simplify the stack because the content is coming from the code. The content is not coming from some external API now. And so it makes it really possible to um, simplify and not have to have another service that you pay for where you can pull uh, just content and images and stuff like that. And it could just, just natively integrate with Shopify. I know this goes similar to some of the misconceptions of Shopify um, and how it can be uh, suited for pretty much every commerce brand. But in your experience, like what aspects of Shopify are kind of underutilized uh, by a business? And it'd be great if you could give us an example of how, maybe how a brand can leverage some of these features more effectively. As far as things that are underutilized in Shopify, I think that Shopify has really killed it with so many different features over the last year and a half that... Um, Many businesses are just sleeping on the features because, you know, they've been on Shopify for so long that uh, they don't even know it's possible. Uh, so one of them is, of course, markets. Now, that's received a huge improvement uh, with the latest release of markets from a unification perspective. It's now possible to not have a PhD in how markets work and how Shopify works to kind of understand full flow, like where customizations are being made in what markets for which products for which pages and stuff like that, it's really um, a massive improvement uh, that they're making uh, that I don't really see anyone else even attempting uh, uh, in, the, in the same sense. Uh, but yeah, I'll give you an example. A lot of merchants use search apps. Uh, they'll use SearchSpring or Nosto or Bloomreach or um, let's call it Algolia. There are so many different uh, search solutions. And while those have historically been a requirement for Shopify because it's out of the box search has been historically pretty bad. Uh, Shopify has stepped up and search and discovery, the native Shopify application for uh, allowing for control over filters and the activation of semantic search is pretty excellent. Uh, now, I'm not going to say it's good for everyone. Uh, when it comes to providing, uh, let's call it filters for uh, collection pages that have more than 5,000 products. Let's just say that it has failed um, categorically in that area. And um, it's kind of uh, pissed off a couple of uh, merchants that we work with that it's just such a glaring issue. 
uh, that hasn't really been addressed yet. Um, but if you have less than 5,000 products for collection pages, by all means, try it if you haven't. Um, it's pretty good out of the box, and it uh, has a lot of good features um, that uh, can allow you to really like save on costs. So uh, in the case of Open Farm, we migrated them off of Algolia, which was pretty much underutilized and just took them straight to native Shopify uh, search and it works it works just fine. And I mean better than fine. It's it's pretty excellent. Another thing that's pretty good around Shopify right now is the promotions. And so the out of the box promotions are stackable. Um, a lot of our historical brands don't even know this uh, because they took so long to migrate off of extensibility that they um, didn't even see the option that they could combine uh, discount rules with others. So you can combine a discount rule with an order level or a product level discount or a shipping uh, level discount. And so you can allow for multiple coupons. And we see some merchants that are still using apps that are doing some fancy things where <laughs> they take over uh, and generate some promos kind of behind the scenes when a customer does it on the storefront. It's kind of not necessary. Um, Shopify now also has a storefront API that unifies the cart tokens. And so you can now use the storefront API to apply a discount in cart uh, and actually get a correct calculation of what the the price of the order is going to be right in the cart in the storefront without having to go to checkout. Uh, so that's, I think, something that uh, some brands are sleeping on. And beyond that, there are apps that are now allowing you to programmatically create these extremely complicated decision trees around the applicability of promotional rules. So there's one that I um, am familiar with. The name escapes me right now, but essentially it gives you the ability to create a discount function and say, well, I want this to apply to only my customers named Greg, and I want it only to apply uh, to the first three products, um, but then if they add six, I want to give them half off, right? Just like really, really complicated rules are now possible uh, and they're possible to build from a user interface. Um, though the interface, I'm not going to say, is like super straightforward to understand. There's, of course, documentation, but um, the, the programmers behind this custom app have essentially taken all of the potential rules that are possible um, in the new functions uh, API that Shopify has released, these uh, price functions, and they've essentially let you build it, like almost visually build all of the rules uh, and apply them. And so you don't even need to have a programmer to create these like extremely sophisticated uh, price rules. So shout out to the Super Easy app uh, in that case. That's the one, uh, one word, Super Easy, that uh, gives you that power. While there's so much that I can talk about, I think the last one that I'll mention is just Shopify Flow. If you're on Plus, Shopify Flow has been improving steadily over the last year. And at this point, it is possible to do things that were just incredibly um, unique uh, before. So I'll give you a, a weird example of something that you could potentially build if you wanted to um, in Flow. So one new paradigm in Shopify Flow is the ability to call any admin API in Shopify. And so... What the admin API does, specifically mutations in the admin API, is you can say when a customer creates a cart and that cart has an item with an attribute, uh, you can create a product <laughs> with the name of the attribute that they put in, like the engraved name or something like that, uh, straight from Flow by taking advantage of the Shopify GraphQL API um, action inside of Flow. And that's, of course, um, an extra, let's call it a necessary implementation. Like, I don't think anyone is planning on building something like that, but it just kind of goes to show that with the visual flow builder, you can now create such sophisticated capabilities and automations without having to involve a developer. And it's really just a great win when that's possible without having to build out architecture and infrastructure and have to maintain it and stuff like that. Shopify really is killing it in terms of flow and making it possible to take advantage of a lot of customizations. And then where, where flow fails, there is mechanic, mechanic.dev, which is much more 
powerful, but definitely requires um, a lot more, let's call it engineering expertise. Now, I say this a lot on the show, but <laughs> we're just rolling into Q4 right now. It's so interesting. Um, when I open my email up every morning, I always see a Black Friday, Cyber Monday, or a Q4 kind of holiday season kind of roundup post. And there's webinars and eBooks and PDFs. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's all, you know, it's start early is the main theme right now. And uh, being in September right now, it's it's important for brands to to be all in and thinking about what should they be working on. And I'd love to hear it from your perspective. Once again, merchant facing, I know you have a lot of uh, conversations with brands and stuff. So what are some of your top recommendations to make sure that brands are preparing for this busy time, this kind of share of wallet? And then how can they execute a really successful BFCM and then how that momentum kind of rolls into the remainder of the holiday season? Well, uh, in general, I would say that if you are working with an agency, try to start doing the things or finish the things by maybe September and, you know, worst case by mid-October. Uh, so that you don't have to scramble uh, during Black Friday, Cyber Monday. We tend to find ourselves uh, pretty busy the month of November because you know, people need things last minute. And um, it's uh, it's uh, a time in the month where we just kind of have to say no a lot because uh, we're, we're kind of completely booked. So I'd just say, one, uh, make sure that you have clear goals and those clear goals are scheduled to be done before uh, you even need it for the holiday season because um, the worst is when you release something and you have people working, you know, through the day and through the night, and there's a mistake and it costs sales. So I would say keep that in mind. Now, if we were talking about another platform, I would have all kinds of things to say around infrastructure and doing stress testing and stuff like that because you're most likely uh, to be on Shopify. You don't necessarily have to worry about those things. However, uh, it has been the case before that uh, some app uh, may actually have trouble dealing with volume. And if you're the kind of merchant that brings extremely high volume to the website, pay attention to how third-party apps are injecting functionality on the website. If you're relying on a third-party app to load a script and to execute some customization, um, be aware uh, that they may uh, fail during Black Friday, Cyber Monday. And so ensure that if the script is loaded, if it is injected, it is non-blocking, it is async, and it is defer. And it does not uh, sit somewhere in the head of the page where it might actually prevent the rest of the site from loading. Um, we've seen it at times where some script goes down and it doesn't go down immediately. It's more of a timeout. And so because it wasn't async and it wasn't set to defer, it would just hold back the rendering of the rest of the page. So um, do keep in mind that just because you're on Shopify doesn't mean you're safe from those kinds of things. So do know what your third parties are and make sure in general is good hygiene to keep you know, apps that you don't use, don't need, keep them out of your store. Uninstall them. Uh, don't keep them around. And if you manually added something, um, assuming that it is not... Um, like assuming that the coding is correct, um, make sure that it's set to async and defer um, so that it doesn't hold back the rest of the page from loading. So you don't have that dependency and you don't have uh, an issue come Black Friday, Cyber Monday, where it's an emergency and you need someone to figure out what's wrong. This one might sound obvious, but uh, I would say make sure that your analytics game is also on point and you have all of your analytics tracked and working properly and validate that they are as such because you're going to want to monitor um, during peak traffic just how your website does. What are the strong products? What are the weak products? Um, how do your customers behave? And you know we've had situations where other things were prioritized and analytics wasn't tested and validated before going live. Uh, or something new was introduced uh, to track and it wasn't fully tested and you know it was just data that was never recorded and therefore insight that was lost. So do plan ahead. If you have a campaign strategy where you're bringing people in, make sure that you're properly tracking them. Make sure that you test that the analytics are properly getting recorded uh, because you know every spike in traffic is a learning experience and you want to make sure that you're capturing it. Now, 
obviously AI is on a lot of people's mind. There's, you know, it's probably the largest kind of emerging technology or trend, so to speak, um, in commerce. And there's so many applications for it. And so I'll flip it back to you. Like, like where do you see um, these emerging technologies? It can be AI or other parts uh, of e-commerce or any trends that you see. Just being merchant facing, I think you're in a very unique position. Your lens is different than a lot of people because you see a lot of mid-market and enterprise brands. And would love if you could kind of share where you believe a lot of these trends and technologies are kind of headed. And then maybe how can businesses kind of prepare for these changes now and then into the future? I don't have a particularly fancy answer to this question. I think the current generative uh, pre-trained transformers, right, ChatGPT, Claude, are uh, really, really cool uh, in a developer's toolkit and building out internal systems and uh, data pipelines that are um, historically very, very difficult to do. Um, and so there's so many more solutions that are on the table. And I would say that to me, the thing that's most bright about the future is that it seems as though complexity is going down. And that's really, really important. The, the simpler it is to implement things, the better e-commerce systems are out the gate, um, the easier it is to take a business goal a proposition and implement it and um, kind of move on to the next big thing. And so I think ultimately solving problems seems to be getting easier because there's just so much more things that are available to engineers uh, to solve those problems. And it's exciting because um, almost always, historically, it's been the case that we want to do something really cool for a merchant, but it's just too expensive or too time consuming. And that's becoming less and less the case because the tools and the technologies that are available are better. And uh, can do more for us without us having to put in nearly as much effort as historically we may have had to do. So the biggest thing that I would say to keep in mind is um, architecture. Um, and if you have complicated stacks, try to reduce complexity, try to, try to reduce your maintenance burden, try to make it really easy to be open and available to take advantage of opportunities when they arise. And you know, try not to build something that's perfect, uh, but try to make something that's minimally viable, something that uh, can test the hypothesis, test the business idea, and get it out fast in front of users and see how it does and iterate on that. Yeah. Well, Georgie, I have to wrap up for today's show. Um, do you have any final thoughts or any? I mean, I took a lot of notes here today, so clearly uh, this is going to be a very impactful, very actionable show. But I just would love to hear it from you about any final thoughts or takeaways that you would like to share with our listeners. Thanks so much. I think there's not a lot of takeaways that I think I could state here at the end that maybe I haven't already mentioned over the course of this conversation. Um, keep solutions simple. Um, don't over engineer put features in front of users sooner, uh, try to keep good hygiene around apps and uh, remove that which you do not use. Um, I think staying up to date is extremely useful and important. Shopify does a good job of reflecting on the changes that they've made in the Shopify dashboard as you enter it. They kind of always cover some of the things that they've released. If you're a Shopify partner, when you log into your partner dashboard, they kind of tell you about their recent releases so that you can kind of take a look. I think Shopify has an extremely good, let's call it a uh, university, where you can learn a lot of comprehensive topics. I think the coursework and the material is pretty decent, and you can learn a lot, uh, even if you think you know Shopify well. Uh, Shopify has put energy and effort into making those as valuable as possible without being too boring. So keep learning and I guess uh, we'll catch each other around. Well, which end as the next steps for listeners who would like to learn more about Absolute Web or maybe even connect with you personally? Yeah, you can um, reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can just key in my name. If you want to reach out to our company, you can reach out to absoluteweb.com. We have a contact form, we have a phone number. 
though I'd reach out over email unless you have something really complicated to say and you need to speak to someone, then I would say, please reach out to me over LinkedIn. I'll probably get you a more clear and comprehensive answer that way. Uh, thanks so much. Well, Georgie, thanks so much uh, for sharing your insights and your recommendations today. I mean, this was a great second episode. We had to have you on twice because there's just so much great content out there and there's a lot of education that needs to happen. And I think you and the Absolute Web team have been phenomenal and continue to be phenomenal partners with Shopify and are really helping brands to either replatform or grow and scale. And I just love the fact that you're involved in the latest strategies, the latest trends. Um, you understand understand the Shopify platform intimately and you know, there's there's really no strategy that's too hard to implement and so if you have a brand and you are looking to create unique experiences online Shopify and the team at Absolute Web in my opinion are well poised as being like you know a great partner that you may want to consider so uh, thanks a lot it's been an amazing episode I just think it's full of a lot of strategy and a lot of tactics yeah, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for having me. Um, this is great, I think. Sometimes having the conversations where we kind of uncover things that maybe I don't always get asked is, is always interesting. And it's always fun to hear how my answers change over time. And yeah, I'm lucky to be here. Uh, lucky for you to bring me on. And uh, I appreciate your time. And I hope everyone that's listening has gotten some value out of this. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for today's episode of the Fast Lane. You know, and thank you from the bottom of my heart for tuning in. You know, this podcast really is all about helping you grow your Shopify store. And we bring the best minds in business to share their secrets so that you can take your brand to the next level. And every time you listen, you know, you really are taking the steps towards building that amazing direct-to-consumer brand that I know you've been dreaming of. And it means the world to me that you've invested your time here, your dedication to learning and growing is truly inspiring. And you know, whether you're a beginner or a seasoned pro, remember that I'm here for you. I'm cheering for you every step of the way. Your success really is the heartbeat of this podcast. And we're here to support your Shopify journey in any capacity. So enjoy the rest of the week and keep thriving with Shopify.